So let's talk about odds and lines. Um, this is a, a new part of my slide deck for just for today. So um, this is the first time I'm using these examples. Bear with me. I hope that they, they work the way that I hope they will work. Um, so if I'm an odds maker, if I'm, if I'm a bookie, if I'm working for a casino or I'm working in Vegas to try to set odds on various outcomes, um, and let's be honest, if you, if you can gamble in Vegas, you can bet on pretty much anything. Um, horse races, dog races, presidential elections, um, you, know, you name it. Uh, so in a moment, we're actually going to look at some odds. Um, one, from, one list of odds from the Kentucky Derby last year, um, this year's Kentucky Derby, probably happening in about six weeks from now or so. Um, I don't even think they've picked the field yet. I don't even think they have an official date for this year's Kentucky. I was trying to look for it this morning, and I couldn't find it. Um, but uh, So we'll look at some, some horse race odds. Um, and then also, we'll look at the current state of odds making in Vegas for the 2016 presidential election. Um, because you can actually bet on who's going to win the presidential election with certain odds makers. Um, and they have set some odds that consistently change over the course of the campaigns as, ca as candidates' fortunes rise and fall. Um, so we'll have the most recent odds for the current field of, of five major party nominees. Um, and the job of an odds maker, really, if, if I'm going to work to make book, is I want to create incentives for gamblers to come and wager on things. Right? I want to set the odds in such a way um, that as many gamblers as possible believe that it's worth it to them to take the gamble. Right? And if those gamblers are doing the expected value calculations that we are doing today, um, Odds makers kind of assume that that's what they're doing, and they're going to set the odds accordingly. Um, and they create what are called odds lines. And these odds lines get published, um, published on websites. Uh, I think they still get published in some newspapers, um, for, especially for big things like uh, you know, the Kentucky Derby. They'll come out the morning of the race and publish, here are the odds uh, for all the various horses in the race. Um, and the odds line is fundamentally written to be a relationship between those two quantities, the risk and the reward that we were talking about earlier. So it's a relationship between the amount of money that you would wager on an outcome and the amount of profit that that wager would pay out if that outcome actually came to pass, if it prevailed. So here is a little screenshot of the morning odds lines from the 2015 Kentucky Derby. So there were 20 horses in the race in 2015. Um, this is just a few of them at the, the 15th through 20th spots. Um, and then the name of the horse is in the first column right here. And then it's got the name of the jockey in this column and the trainer in that column. And I, and I have to think, you have to be pretty deep into horses to really like, make decisions on who to bet on based on the jockey and the trainer, um, and not just based on the odds, really. I don't know anything about horses, but I have placed an occasional bet on a horse in my life. And I usually just use the odds to do so. Um, and the odds are what are in this last column. So that's what I want to focus on for a minute. So odds, when they're written in this fashion, they look like a fraction, but they're not exactly a fraction in the way that we usually think about uh, how rational numbers are represented as fractions. Um, instead, the way that they report odds is that they report a relationship between the amount of profit, so that's the first number, the amount of profit that you would make, um, versus the amount of risk that you would have to expose yourself to in order to make that profit. So let's look at Mr. Z. Uh, the horse in uh, position 17 here. So I read in an article this morning that uh, Mr. Z's trainer, D. Wayne Lucas, um, actually had been the trainer for four previous Kentucky Derby winning horses. So the trainer has a very good pedigree. Um, but something about the horse or something about the jockey made it so that Mr. Z was not particularly favored to win the Derby last year. Um, how can we tell that based on the odds, which are written here, which we would read as 50 to 1? What is that 50 to 1 mean, according to how odds lines are being reported. That's right. If, if we risk a dollar, so if I bet a dollar on this horse, if I bet a dollar on Mr. Z, then I will win 50 if he wins. And again, in horse racing, like in Powerball, there are umpteen different ways to actually place a bet. Um, so we're just going to restrict our attention here to betting on a horse to win. Right? There are a lot of other ways to bet, but um, this would just be the, the odds on winning. So what does the relationship between the risk and the reward tell us about what the odds makers believe about Mr. Z? What does 50 to 1 sound like to your gambling ears? To 
put a finer point on it. Um, is Mr. Z expected to win this race, or is he a long shot? Long shot. How can you tell he's a long shot? Because uh, your risk is, is so low, but your reward is so high. Right. It's a very, very high reward for a very small amount of risk. So if this horse were really, really likely to win, and we set the odds at 50 to 1, then there's a really good chance that the odds house, the, the casino, or whoever is making the book on this, will have to pay out a whole lot of money because they only got in a little bit right, for bets on Mr. Z. So the fact that these odds are so high is an indication that the bookie does not believe Mr. Z has a very good shot at winning. And accordingly, not many people are probably going to place winning bets on Mr. Z for this race. Right? Um, a few might decide to do it anyway, but not that many. And so the exposure of the gambling house to the risk of Mr. Z winning is also not that high, right? because not many people have placed bets on it. So we would call that horse a long shot. Yeah, I do. Yep. Um, which oh, I'll mention in a moment. Uh, OK, so if Mr. Z is the long shot in this list of six horses, um, who would you say is the favorite? American Pharaoh. American Pharaoh. So the odds on American Pharaoh are 5 to 2. So what does that odds ratio tell you? Yeah, if I bet $2, so this is one of the interesting things about this ratio, is that most ratios and when we're talking about odds are something to one, right? It's always based on a $1 bet. Um, but in the desire to keep everything in whole numbers, sometimes they will have a $2 bet or a $4 bet or a $5 bet or something. But if I bet $2 on American Pharaoh, then I'm going to win 5 so the amount, the, the comparison of, of profit to risk here is, is much smaller. I get a much smaller amount of profit for my risk for American Pharaoh. And that's because the odds maker doesn't want me to make too much profit on my bet for American Pharaoh because the odds maker thinks American Pharaoh is favored to win. Okay. Um, and in fact, even if you look at the rest of the 20 horses um, in this race, 5 to 2 is actually the, the, the best odds of any of the 20 horses in this race. Um, and so American Pharaoh was actually the favorite. Um, so, and we'll kind of sort of process how to, to think about odds ratios and how they compare to the actual probabilities uh, of these horses winning in a moment. Um, but I can give this away because this race happened last year that in fact the favorite American Pharaoh did win uh, the Kentucky Derby last year. And so this 5 to 2 ended up paying out. Um, and all of the risk that gamblers exposed themselves to on the other 19 horses, if they bet on them to win, uh, was unrealized as profit. So that went to the house. So this is, I think, the most common way to represent odds when they're published uh, for things like horse races, dog races, and so forth. But there's actually a second way that sometimes uh, odds are represented. Now, there's probably even more than these two different ways, but these are kind of the two of the more common and the two that we're going to look at in just a moment. Um, the second is called the money line. So here is the money line on the next president of the United States as of March 22nd, so that was two days ago, um, published by a gambling site called Bovada. So uh, if one were inclined to bet on this race, I believe Bovada gives you an opportunity to do so, although you know, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and these are the top five candidates in the race right now, to two of them Democratic and three of them Republican. Um, and They've written the odds in a slightly different way. So rather than using the profit and the risk and just re reporting it as 5 to 2, for example, in our horse example, um, here they've represented them as these numbers that are either positive or negative. Um, and these numbers are based on a $100 basis. And numbers that are positive means that if I wagered $100, if I risked $100, I would win that amount. So for example, if we look at, uh, let's say, Ted Cruz for a moment who's at the bottom of this list. Ted Cruz is listed at plus 2,000, which would mean that uh, if I risk, if I wager $100 on Ted Cruz to win, I'd win $2,000. So let me ask you this before we move on. How would that look as a ratio in, like a, in the, the horse race example? If were to write it as that ratio with a fraction bar, what would it look like? Yeah, 20 to 1, because one, it's the same as 2,000 divided by 100, right? But if we reduce that fraction down by dividing it by 100, we end up with 20 to 1. Just erase the zeros. 
So according to what's written here, um, this auction house imagines Ted Cruz to be a 20 to 1 shot uh, to be the next president of the United States. So that's how to interpret the positive numbers in a money line. The negative numbers flip that relationship on their head. So Hillary Clinton here is listed as minus 200. Um, and that means, as a minus number, that that 200 is the amount that I would have to wager in order to win $100 of profit. So if I wager 200, I'd win 100. So the role of the $100 is different on a money line if the money line is positive versus if it's negative. Um, how would we report those odds as a horse race ratio? What would that look like? One to two, exactly. My winnings would be $100 for a $200 risk, and reducing that fraction by dividing it by 100 would mean if this were a horse race, and I really do believe that there are many in the, in the news media that believe presidential elections to be nothing better than horse races, um, then the odds on Hillary Clinton winning that race would be one listed as one to two. So this is just a different way that, that things are sometimes reported. So if we wanted to do some analysis on the expected value of a bet on one of these candidates, um, then that's how we would convert this into the odds, uh, the way that they're reported for a horse race. If we're rolling dice or drawing cards or something, then mathematically we can come up with theoretical probabilities of things happening that can tell us how to set the prices for a game, for example. But things like horse races or presidential elections, there are so many variables that can affect the outcome. There's not really much we can do theoretically to decide, for example, how likely American Pharaoh is to win. We can look at American Pharaoh's performances in past races. Um, we can condition it based on knowing who his jockey was in those races, uh, what it, the health conditions of the horse were, the conditions of the track, the competition, the location, the weather, all these things. We could create these really sophisticated models. Um, maybe odds makers do some of that. I think the, the best odds makers will. Um, if you're familiar with 538, the, the website that is a part of ESPN, um, their big operation, their kind of a, a data and, and probability uh, in the media operation, um, they do things like come up with probabilities for presidential candidates winning elections and probabilities for sports teams winning their championship and so forth. Um, and so they build a lot of very sophisticated models to do that sort of thing. Um, if I'm an odds maker, what I want to do is set the odds to be high enough to attract uh, somebody to gamble, right? The higher I set these odds, the more reward there is for a given amount of risk, and so the more attractive it's going to be for a gambler. Um, but as an odds maker, I also have my bosses to deal with, right? I have my, my own books to balance, and so I don't want to set the odds so high as to expose the house to the risk of losing too much money. Right? If I had set American Pharaoh at 50 to 1, I would have taken a bath last year, right? Because American Pharaoh ended up winning, and if people knew that, if the gamblers knew that, then I would have had a lot of bets on American Pharaoh that would pay out 50 times what they brought in. So it's my job as an odds maker to find the balance between a high enough odds to attract gambling, but not so high as to make it so that there's a potential outcome where the house loses a whole bunch of money. Right? It still could happen, but we want to minimize those, uh, that risk that exists to the house. So as a gambler on the other side, if I'm not an odds maker, what I can do is imagine, so the default assumption might be, that an odds maker is going to set the odds in such a way as to make the game fair to play. In other words, the odds maker is going to set the odds at exactly that balance point, the expected value, um, at which a gambler would have kind of a difficult decision whether or not to play, because they would expect to come away with as much profit as they had to pay to play the game. So under that default assumption, Let's look at American Pharaoh one more time. If American Pharaoh has uh, odds of five to two to win the mm -hmm. Kentucky Derby, then what does the odds maker expect the probability of American Pharaoh winning the race to be? Well, here's how we can convert the five out of two into the probability of winning. If the probability is really five to two, what the odds maker is expecting is that if this horse races a total of seven times, so I'm taking five and two and I'm adding them together, seven races, so five plus two. If the horse races seven times, then with five to two odds, the odds maker is expecting that the horse will win two out of those seven times. 
So if this horse races seven times, um, then we expect the horse is going to win twice out of those seven times. Um, so what does that mean that they imagine the probability of this horse losing, not winning, is? If the winning probability is two out of seven, what's the losing probability? Five out of seven, right. So if there's two wins in, in seven races expected, then there's five losses in seven races. And let's take a moment and understand why that's what I would imagine this winning probability and losing probability to be. So here's a calculation for you. Let's suppose that I wager how much do you want to put on American Pharaoh? We already know that he wins, uh, but let's just, so what amount do you want to pick for a bet? 20 bucks, sure. So if I want to place a $20 bet on American Pharaoh to win, then there's two possibilities for what might happen. American Pharaoh wins, or American Pharaoh does not win. Now, if American Pharaoh wins, uh, let's say this, profit. How much is my profit going to be? If I've risked $20, how much do I get back if American Pharaoh wins? According to the odds. So, in order to, remember what 5 to 2 means. What does 5 to 2 mean again? Right, I'm going to get $5 back. Um, on a $2 bet. So, right, if I wager 20, I'm going to get $100. Wait a minute, not 100. Um, if a $2 bet gets me 5, a $20 bet is going to get me 50. There we go. So all we've done is we've scaled up those odds by a factor of 10, right? Every $2 is going to get me 5. So if I have 10 times as many as $2, I'm going to get 10 times as many as $5. So I'm going to profit 50 bucks um, if uh, American Pharaoh actually wins on my $20 bet. Um, on the other hand, if American Pharaoh loses, then I'm out that 20 bucks, right? So I'm going to consider that to be a negative $20. I've lost my bet. Um, and then we also know what the probability of each of those outcomes is. Uh, the probability was, for winning, 2 out of 7. For losing, 5 out of 7. So what's the expected value of my wager? The expected, uh, expected amount of winnings. How do I find it? Let's say expected profit for me. How do I find it? How do you compute an expected value? Two-step process. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to, well, it's up to you. Um, if you prefer to work with fractions, and most people don't, uh, we can work with fractions. If you prefer to work with decimals, we can, although there's going to be some rounding off involved. Um, let's go ahead and work with decimals, if it feels more comfortable. Um, two out of seven is point two eight six, roughly. 5 out of 7 is point, uh, 0.714. There we go. So there are the decimals that approximate this probability. So I'm going to set you to the task now of computing this expected profit based on knowing what our actual profits are for a win and a loss on a $20 wager, balanced with the probabilities of those outcomes actually happening. So now I'm interested to hear for a $20 bet on American Pharaoh, what's your expected profit according to how things are set up here? Zilch. Zilch. How'd you get that? How'd you find this expected value? Because if you take 50 multiplied by the 2.86, mm -hmm. you get something around 14.28. 14.28. And if you do the same with a negative 20 times the 71.4, you get something around negative 14.8. OK. So that's what happens when you multiply. And then you add those two together, and lo and behold, the expected profit is zilch. So what then do we decide about whether it's a good idea to bet on American Pharaoh? 
It's a toss-up, right? Shrugging. If my expected profit were positive, then it would be a no-brainer, right? On average, a positive expected profit will mean that I actually make money on this bet. If the expected profit were negative, then it's an easy decision to walk away. Because on average, I'm not going to walk away with more than I had to expose myself to for risk. But when the expected profit is zero, mathematically, we call that a fair game. And it's probably not the case that odds makers are designing the odds to make it fair, exactly fair, uh, because they want to make a profit for their, for their books, right? Um, but under the best possible assumption that we have based on no additional evidence, um, if the odds makers were designing for a fair game, then this is how they would be imagining the win and loss probabilities. For a horse like American Pharaoh, which is a five to two favorite, they're imagining that that horse has a two sevenths chance of winning and a five sevenths chance of not winning so exactly so that the expected profit for this race would be nothing to make it fair.